So for this, the last lecture of our, uh, the classical mechanics portion of our physics, we'd like to consider um, a very, uh, a problem, a very realistic application. Because I've already considered the harmonic oscillator, and once again, drawing here, I have a support uh, here. And uh, I'll draw it with a, a spring arranged vertically this way, and a mass supported uh, by the spring, spring of spring constant k, mass m. And I know quite a bit about the oscillation of this oscillator. I know that the motion is periodic, that the solution of the differential equation will be cosines. There's a time period and a frequency associated with the square root of k over m. I know that the fact that it's arranged vertically, uh, the gravitational force simply displaces the equilibrium position. So it vibrates about a force equilibrium between that gravitational force and the stretch of the spring under the influence of force. I know quite a bit. I also know that if I solve this problem, the energy is conserved because the spring is an elastic force. It has associated with it a potential energy. And so as it oscillates, the energy is simply exchanged between kinetic energy, gravitational potential energy, and spring energy as it oscillates back and forth. But at any instant in time, the total mechanical energy is conserved. That certainly is not realistic. Imagine I built the thing for real and I set it oscillating. Eventually, it would slow to a stop. This is caused by two factors. One is the heating of the spring as it stretches and compresses. That's a very complicated uh, issue right there. But the greater issue is the viscous drag of the fluid through which the, the oscillator moves. So the oscillator energy will dissipate over time. And what I'd like to do today is investigate that and see if it's possible that I could find the solution for the position of the oscillator as a function of time under these circumstances. So I'll add a little bit to my diagram here. What I choose to do is I'll have a kind of vein that hangs down here into a, a, a beaker. And the beaker is full of some fluid. And so what happens as the mass oscillates on the spring, the, the thing is sloshing up and down, and there's viscous drag associated with that. I'm going to imagine that the viscous drag, it's funny the way it looks, the water is sort of sloshing, well, I'll not worry about that. Um, the viscous drag that I'm going to imagine is going on here is a very slow speed viscous drag. So I'm going to imagine viscous drag proportional to the velocity. That is, I'll consider a drag force that is, in general, obviously resistive to the motion. So I'll drop a negative sign there, although when I write Newton's second law, we'll see what happens. Uh, a constant b, which is associated with the cross-sectional area, the density of the fluid, and so forth, all of those factors. It's just sort of a, visc a drag coefficient there. And is proportional to the speed v uh, of the oscillator at any given time. So that's a new force added to the oscillator, which naturally is going to change the differential equation. Anytime I'm asked to write a differential equation that describes the motion of the system, that means writing Newton's second law. So I'll get about the business of doing that by writing Newton's second law, the sum of all the forces that affect the motion of the oscillator is equal to the mass times the acceleration. Since I'm doing harmonic oscillation, I'm naturally going to write as x double dot, as I've been doing for the, for the past few lectures. So the net force is equal to x double dot. Well, what forces do I have acting here? I will once again ignore the gravitational force mg, because I've already demonstrated by a change of coordinate that the weight force is simply going to shift the equilibrium position down, and that is the point about which the oscillation will be done. So I'll spare us that change of coordinate in this, and consider the two forces that affect the motion thereafter, which is the spring force, which I'll write as negative kx, which is not surprising. The spring is stretched from its equilibrium position and therefore creates a restorative force whose magnitude is linearly proportional to position. But also now I have a viscous drag force, and I'm writing this in such a way that I'm considering the motion as the system travels downward, with downward being the positive direction. As the system travels downward, with downward being the positive direction, and therefore, in this configuration, both the spring force and the viscous drag force are retarding forces. The spring is trying to pull the mass back up, and the viscous drag is opposing the downward motion by a force directed up. When the oscillator changes direction, the direction of these forces change. But I don't need to worry about all that. That's taking care of the calculus in, in, the, in the dynamics of the equation of motion. All taken care of. It's going to be the same thing as saying doing uh, projectile motion and solving the problem for the motion up and then starting again and solving for the motion down. I don't have to worry about the change in direction. It's built into the mathematics of the. So negative kx minus bv is equal to m x double dot. And immediately we know, based on you know, the previous lecture, the discussion was, does it look like the harmonic oscillator differential equation? Most assuredly, it does not. Because when I rearrange it and try to put it in its, in its traditional form, I'll have x double dot plus k over mx, and everything's going splendidly at this point, plus b over m uh, v. But v 
is x dot. So where I would write in v here, I'll write x dot for the time rate of change. So I see the dependence across the way, and all of that is equal to zero. That is most assuredly not a harmonic oscillator differential equation. Not at all a harmonic oscillator differential equation. So it does not have solutions that are cosines, and that does not surprise me. Because a cosine function goes on forever and ever and ever and ever. Which sort of implies right there the law of conservation of energy. Well, the energy is not conserved here. So the energy of the oscillation should dissipate uh, over time. Recall that the energy of the oscillator in general, the total energy that I give an oscillator, like here would be at the initial condition, is one half the spring constant of the oscillator multiplied by the amplitude squared. Well, what will phys uh, physio physically, what's going to happen? is that the amplitude of the oscillation will decrease over time. We know that from experience. We all can imagine that as this oscillator goes, its amplitude will just de decrease and decrease over time. Because the energy is being dissipated, and the energy is proportional to the amplitude. So when the energy is dissipated, the amplitude naturally decreases. So what do I expect solutions like this to look like? Because for the first time I solved the harmonic oscillator, in the case where the energy was conserved, I said, let me make a guess as to what the solution is by drawing a graph of the position as a function of time and seeing if that would give me some indication of what it should be. Well, here, what do I expect? Well, I expect it to be sort of cosine because it does oscillate. But I expect it to oscillate in such a way that the amplitude decreases over time. And so I'm going to draw it like this, with an amplitude that diminishes ultimately to zero when the oscillator comes to rest. Now, looking at that graph, I don't expect anyone. So look at that graph and say, oh, I have a guess. I know what it is. I don't particularly have a guess for that kind of graph or what it should look like. Um, with a little bit of experience, I might make a, a good guess at it and have a go, but I don't really know. So I have to solve this differential equation with a bit more mathematical cleverness than I've ever done before. And the method that I use to do it is a really important one because what I'm going to do is make an assumption that I think will stun and unsettle some of you. I'm going to assume that the position of the oscillator as a function of time is a complex number. I don't think anybody expected me to say that at that point. I'm going to assume that the position as a function of time is a complex number. Why would you do such a thing? It's because we've discovered after doing lots and lots of mathematics that it's often an effective tool for solving differential equations. And I'm going to demonstrate that here. So there's, there's utility for you, the student, to see this technique because you will ultimately see it done again to solve different problems uh, in the future. So I'm going to make an assumption that the position as a function of time is equal to a plus b, uh, or I'm writing that differently than you probably see it. Uh, and I have to be, I want to be careful here because I just wrote b, and I have b as my drag coefficient here. So I'm going to write it a different way. I'm going to write it as x is equal to alpha uh, plus i times beta. That's the form of a complex number. I think maybe when you learned complex numbers for the first time in math class, uh, that one day that you did complex numbers, uh, you probably used A and B, but I don't have the luxury of using B, so I'll use alpha and beta. It looks prettier anyway. This is a complex number. Now, what that means is actually something that you may not realize, it, but you're more familiar with now after all this time that we've spent discussing our physics. Consider a coordinate plane that has two axes, like the x and y axis. Uh, but these, I've got to be careful how I draw this because it's going to be a little bit tricky. I'm going to draw a circle first, and I'm going to draw two axes through this circle, like right through the center of it here. One axis is called the real axis, and so I'll label that RE. And another axis is called IM, the imaginary axis. So what I'm saying is that a complex number is like a vector, like a vector, not a vector. I'm not saying it's a vector, but I'm saying it's like a vector in the sense that it has two components. A complex number has two components, a real component and an imaginary component. And that is an idea that we all should be much more comfortable with now than the first time we encountered complex numbers. Because I can express a complex number like x as a vector in the complex plane that has components in the complex plane alpha along the real axis, because in x alpha is the real number, and beta along the imaginary axis, because beta is the complex component. M, it's an M for imaginary. So those are two components of a complex number, which is a point in the complex plane. So a complex number is the position vector of a point in the complex plane. It has two components. For my oscillator, this complex position goes around in circular motion. Now, I've already made an analogy between circular motion and harmonic oscillation. 
because I drew a circle and said, imagine that it goes around in circular motion and that the projection of that circular motion onto the x-axis would be the harmonic oscillation. So I'm doing the same thing here again, except I'm doing it in the complex plane. I'm doing the same thing again, but I'm doing it in the complex plane. So this position vector, which has a length a, which is the amplitude of the oscillation, has an angular position theta in the complex plane, just like the circular motion analogy. So my complex number, x is equal to alpha i beta, I'm going to write that complex number instead as alpha as a component of the amplitude. That is a times the cosine of theta. a times the cosine of theta. Plus the imaginary component, which is obviously going to be the sine component. So it's going to be a i sine theta. That's the same complex number. I've simply replaced alpha and beta with the components of my complex vector in the complex plane as it goes around the angle theta, which is naturally time dependent. You won't be surprised in a moment, I'm gonna, I'm gonna uh, replace theta with omega t. But now I'm gonna take this, uh, I see that I have the amplitude there, I'm gonna factor it out. So I'll write this as x is equal to, and now I'll leave the thetas in for the moment, a times the cosine of theta plus i sine theta. And I'll actually ask you really quick, surveying the audience, do you recognize cosine theta plus i sine theta? It's a thing. It's called the Euler identity, after the mathematician Euler. And it is equal to e to the i theta. It's equal to e to the i theta. Are we familiar? No? Yeah, that's what it's all about. I love it. There is a relationship that you're just not fully aware of yet between the harmonic functions sine, cosine, and of course tangent, because it's just the ratio of sine and cosine. There's a relationship between sine and cosine and the exponential functions. It turns out that um, sine and cosine are, can actually be written in terms of exponential functions with complex exponents. Now you're not surprised that they haven't told you that yet because they don't want to completely freak you out. This identity definitely demands a proof. I've written a proof of it. I'll post it for you so that you can read it, those of you who are very math interested. Uh, I'll post the proof of it. I don't have time to prove it right here. It is an identity that all of us on a certain level of science and mathematics uh, are always aware of, the Euler identity. So what I'm saying is my guess is going to, for, for the position as a function of time, my guess, right? So you give me permission to do it because I'm saying I'm only guessing. Once I make my guess, I have to demonstrate that that's in fact true. And you might be mystified at this point. Why would you make such a guess? Well, we'll see how it goes. A e to the i omega t. There we go. I've replaced theta with the angular frequency times t. You want to be careful. That angular frequency omega that I've written there is not necessarily k square root of k over m because something's up with this oscillator. So I proved that the frequency was k over m when I did the first derivation. In this derivation, omega might be something different. So I have to be careful about that. In fact, I'm going to find that indeed omega is something different. But, um, I want to be heads up on that, that that's not the square root of k over n. So now I'm going to do something very familiar. I want to, I feel like I want to heads up to you that yes, the demonstration I'm doing is quite complex, but the procedure that I'm doing is identically the same procedure that I did before. How would I demonstrate that my guess is correct? I need to take my guess and plug it into the differential equation and see if there are any conditions under which my guess would make that equation true. So that's what I'm doing next. So. In order to do that, I'm going to need to know what x is as a function of time, and I have that. I'm going to need to know its first derivative. So I'll have to take that first derivative, and I'm going to need to know its second derivative. I'm going to need to know all three. So I'll start up here with the, the, the function of x, which is, I'm just repeating myself, a e to the i omega t, that's my guess. And my first derivative of that, that is the derivative of this. Well, how do I take the derivative of the uh, exponential function again? Well. I take the derivative of the, the, the exponent, I bring it down in front, and the, the exponential is the indestructible function. So it survives that derivative. So I'm going to get i, a, omega. I'm not sure about the order that I just put those terms. It's just, you know, I'm making this stuff up anyways. i, omega, t. So the exponential function survives the derivative. It does, so-called indestructible function. x double dot is the second derivative of that with respect to time. And so i, omega is going to come down again. And that has a particular consequence. When i omega comes down again, I have i times i, which is negative 1. And so a negative sign will appear. No i will appear. The omega will now be squared. 
and e to the i omega t will persist. In order to test this as my solution, I need to take all three of those things and plug them into this differential equation. So it's about to get a little bit uh, weedy. e to the i omega t, that's x double dot, plus k over m multiplied by x, which is just a e to the i omega t, plus b over m uh, times x dot, which is, well, I guess I'll put the i out in front, i, b over m, a, omega, e to the i, omega t, and all of that equal to zero. Well, you see, one of the really nice features that's a very satisfying feature of this is that every single term in my equation here, where I've substituted into my differential equation, every single term has an e to the i, omega t in it. So I can cancel the e to the i, omega t's out. Also notice that every term has an a in it. So I'll cancel all the a's out. Now let's see what I have left over. It's obviously very complicated looking, so I'll write it in a very spare fashion. Omega squared plus uh, k over m plus i b over m omega is equal to zero. If my guess is the correct guess, I need to be able to choose omega so that it satisfies this equation. This equation's quadratic. This equation's quadratic. So in order to find the omega that satisfies this equation, I'm going to have to write the quadratic formula. So omega, and I've written it in such a way, I don't have my terms in order. I should have thought of that as I was going along. So I lose style points here. I wish that I had it so that I had my omega squared term followed by my omega term followed by the, the omega to the zero term. Uh, but I'll make my way through it. This coefficient, obviously a is negative one. B is I B over M and uh, C is k over m. So I'm going to go through and do the quadratic formula because the result of the quadratic is negative b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac over 2m, right? So I'll make that substitution starting with negative b. So that's the negative of i b over m plus or minus the square root of b squared. Now when I square that, I'm going to be squaring i. i squared is negative 1. So that's going to be negative b over m quantity squared minus 4 times a. Well, a is negative 1. So that's going to change the minus 4 into a plus 4 times c. So what I have is plus 4k over m. And all of that is divided by 2a. Well, a is negative 1, so all of that is divided by negative 2. All of that is divided by negative 2. I'm going to make some alterations to this just because I have well, one alteration I want to make is I don't like that at all. I, there's, a, there's some traditional form here that I'm going for. So I'm just going to make some minor alterations to it. First thing I'm going to do is divide the whole thing through by negative 2. And I'm going to swap the order of this difference uh, in, the, in the radical. When I swap the order of the difference, that generates a negative sign out in front. But out in front, it's already plus or minus. So plus or minus becomes minus plus if I reverse, reverse the order inside. So doing those two steps all at once, I'm going to divide this in front here by negative 2. And so omega is going to be equal to negative i b over 2m minus or plus the square root of. Now I've reversed the order of this and I'm divide, brought a 2 in. A 2 brought into the radical is going to be a 4. So I have just k over m uh, minus, you can do it, Chad. I know I can. I know I can. Minus, uh, b over 2m squared. This little term under the radical here is interesting to me because I have a square root of k over m. That is, there's a k over m under the radical. Minus, minus a quantity that is viscous draggy, that is b over 2m squared. What it's telling me is that the viscous drag, that the viscous drag has reduced the frequency. The viscous drag has reduced the frequency because imagine this thing, uh, the mass hang on the spring, and it vibrates back and forth with a certain frequency. When I put an ear, isn't it going to be slowed, right? Just sort of an aesthetic idea. The, the frequency of the thing is going to be slowed by virtue of the viscous drag. And so the frequency is going to be reduced. So this bit here that's under the radical, I'm going to call this omega prime, omega prime, a modified frequency, omega prime a modified frequency. So I can write this rather compactly. And what the statement that I'm making is that my choice for a solution to the differential equation, which was originally a e to the i omega t, is a good one, provided 
omega is equal to negative uh, b over 2m, oh, negative i, pardon me, negative i, b over 2m minus or plus omega prime. Minus or plus omega prime. Well, because I've written it there. Yeah. So I'm going to take this omega now and substitute this omega in to my guess for the position as a function of time. That is now I'm formulating the answer that is the result of my labors here. So the position is a function of time, which is equal to a e to the i omega t is now a e to the i, brace yourself, negative i b over 2m minus or plus omega prime times t times t. This is the, shall I multiply this through? Shall I multiply this through? I'm just a little curious for myself how it is that I'm going to proceed. Yes. Why did the i b remain negative when I divided? You know what? Thank you. Thank you so much. There was a little trick. Here's a little inside baseball that was going on. I was just up here pretending that I hadn't yet decided how to proceed with my algebra for some aesthetic reason. The reason why I was pretending is because I'm looking at this negative sign here and I don't want it. I know what the answer is and I don't want, to be, want it to be there. Lucky for me, Emma's sitting over there looking at it going, why is that negative sign there? That shouldn't be there because when I divided by negative two here, that negative sign should have gone away, which means it's not here, which means I'm now a much happier guy. <laughs> I'm much happier now. So thank you, Emma, I appreciate that. Paying careful attention during the lecture because the professor is going to make mistakes. There is no doubt about it. Uh, but I think I can be forgiven. It's rather complicated what I'm doing, and I'm rather old. So uh, A, E to the, now I'm gonna multiply through by the I with great confidence. Because when I multiply through by the i, I'm going to do i by i times i, and the negative sign will appear. And I want it to. And I want it to be there. Otherwise, my i was going to kill that negative sign, and I was going to be very unhappy. So this is going to be e to the what? Uh, negative b over 2m minus or plus, um, oh, and then multiplied by t. Thank you very much. And uh, minus or plus i omega prime t. Well, this is a... Uh, exponential to the sum. Does anybody know how that breaks down? It's the product of the exponentials. The exponential of the sum is the product of the exponentials, like this. You'll see it as I write it. That x is equal to a e to the minus b over m t times e uh, to the m -m minus, minus, minus or, minus or plus. I get to choose. Uh, let's do mine. I'll keep the minus or plus here just for the moment. I omega prime times T. I'm going to make a choice there, and the choice is rather arbitrary, so it doesn't matter. Am I okay? Oh, it's 2M. Of course it's 2M. Negative B over 2MT. Mm. A does multiply both, but there's no addition. Do you see there's no addition or subtraction there? So it is multiplying both. It is multiplying. I am totally happy with this first term here, A E to the minus B over 2M times T. Love that. I'm going to leave that alone. It's this thing that I'm going to do. What I'm going to do with this is I'm going to expand it using the Euler identity. That is, I'm going to do the Euler identity in, in reverse. Because I previously said that cosine theta plus I sine theta, which I could easily write as cosine omega t plus I sine omega t, that that was equal to e to the I omega t. Now I'm going to do it in reverse. That is, my final position is equal to, well, I'm not sure it's final. I may write another line x. We'll see what happens. B over 2m times t times. Uh, cosine uh, omega prime times t minus or plus, shoot, minus or plus uh, i sine omega prime times t. So I've just reverse Euler identity the thing. I don't know whether Euler identity particularly has a direction that it goes, but I've done it both ways now. So there you have it. I'm saying that that is the position of the oscillator as a function of time. It's got some wonderful properties, but you, the student, should immediately, and this is a wonderful thing that's happening that I won't be able to fully explain to you how wonderful it is until much later on. Sometime in May, we'll come back to this, and I'll talk about this again, and I'll say, remember that moment when this happened? Shadley, you're telling me that this is the position as a function of time of an oscillator that's being damped by a viscous drag force, and I'm willing to believe you, but part of it is a complex number. Part of it is imaginary. That's not really a high quality solution there. It's got imaginary parts to it. So here's what I'm going to do. Can't say cancel it. I'm just going to throw it away. I'm just going to throw it away. And the mathematicians become enraged because you can't just throw it away. 
Yes, I can. Because I'm not doing math, I'm doing science. Science is experimental. So I throw the complex part of the solution away so that my final answer is that the position of the oscillator as a function of time is a e to the minus b over m times t. Oh, I just don't want that 2 to be there. b over 2m times t. And I think everybody in the audience knows why I'm doing that. Because we did so much viscous drag where the coefficient in the exponent was b over m, b over m, b over m, b over m, b over m. And I don't seem to be willing to let the 2 in now, uh, just out of habit. This is my final answer. But I threw away that complex part, no problem. I take this final answer into the laboratory and I do an experiment. And the experiment validates throwing the complex part away. Because I don't need that complex part because it doesn't come into the experimental results at all. It turns out that what I've done is I have inserted a complex number seemingly as a trick. And then at the end, I have removed that complex number because the complex part of the experiment is not in or of the equation is not in any way linked to experimental results. No, this is true for all time. So now, is it okay? So this is your answer. I'm very tired of watching. This is your answer. Is it good? Oh, it's so good. Examine the equation and see what it tells you. First of all, it tells you it's cosiney. How is the motion? It's kind of cosiney. It's going to oscillate with a modified frequency that is lower than the frequency if there were no viscous drag. Because remember I said that under the influence of the viscous drag, it's going to be kind of lazy. And it has an amplitude. Steve, I feel like you're with me. It has an amplitude that exponentially decays. E to the minus is an exponential decay, which means if you look at the peaks here, and I didn't do such a good job of drawing it, but if you look at the peaks here, the peaks will exponentially decay to zero over time. It's a harmonic oscillator with a modified frequency whose amplitude exponentially decays to zero. That is a useful result because any practical oscillator like I, that I build, like in an in a engineering application, is going to have dissipative forces that are going to remove the energy. And when they do, they do it this way.